get the word out and uh, even hosting you at our home uh, with your family. So thank you uh, once again, Angela. Thank you. And I uh, also want to thank uh, the staff, the wonderful staff at ProLife Wisconsin. And uh, we had a new volunteer today, just came in uh, this week, uh, Jolene. Say, say hi to Jolene. She was taking a survey as you walked in. <clears throat> and I uh, just want to know how you found out about the event. Because <clears throat> uh, we're always interested in uh, how our... Uh, how our social media and our advertising works. We also wanted to thank uh, Josie Zignago and Therese Aloya. Uh, where are they? They're probably out, out uh, in the hallway still, uh, trying to herd those people inside. <laughs> but uh, uh, that was a suggestion. And, um, but uh, Therese and uh, uh, Josie have put in a lot of work on this, and uh, many of it, much of it was very last minute. Uh, so we just want to thank them for all their hard work and, and uh, attention to detail. Uh, as many of you know, Pro-Life Wisconsin has uh, three pillars that we work uh, to uh, end abortion. Uh, we educate, we activate, and we legislate uh, throughout the state. And tonight's focus is on education and how we can continue to build that culture of life. And uh, here is Therese Aloya. I don't know if she was in the room. She just appeared magically. But uh, here's Therese. If you don't know Therese, uh, you'll want to get to know her. She's our programs coordinator, our programs director at Life Wisconsin. Uh, we brought her all the way from um, Florida. Florida. <laughs> I was trying to think of what city it was, but <clears throat> Gainesville. Gainesville. Okay. Um, but uh, if you hear her saying y'all, that's why. Um, she's from the South. Uh, so, but before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the items left uh, on your seat. You might be sitting on them. You might have thrown them on the floor. Uh, you might have them on your lap. Uh, but um, the booklet that you are holding is complimentary. It's a copy of Before Moses, and it was written by Hugh Owen. It's a great follow-up to read uh, after tonight's talk uh, that you'll hear this evening. There's also a pink sheet of paper that lists all the products that can be purchased through the Colby Center for the study of creation. Um, just a way to round out your library at home. Okay, so um, Josie uh, took all that and uh, organized it on there so that you can probably find it. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's uh, alpha alphabetized, but um, but all of uh, all of the uh, items uh, that you would like you to have in your library are uh, right there on that sheet. So. Thank you, Josie. Say hello to Josie. She's standing by the door holding the wall up. Thank you. Hi, Josie. Also, we have refreshments. Uh, eat them. Uh, we have coffee, uh, tea, um, maybe some uh, water, I think, in the back. So um, feel free to get up at any time during, during the talk and, um, and help yourself. Because otherwise, I have to eat it <laughs> before we leave. Um, do we have uh, any uh, any clergy in the crowd? I don't see any. <clears throat> so I'm going to start us with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to proclaim uh, the gospel of life to every rock and creature uh, that comes into our path. We thank you for the gift of our own lives, and we thank you for uh, the ability um, to give this gift of life to others through Pro-Life Wisconsin. We thank you for the gift of Hugh Owen, uh, who so selflessly gave of his time to come here um, by way of uh, Louisiana. Uh, he's been away from home for quite some time and uh, given, given of his, uh, his, his time to share uh, this um, fascinating, fascinating talk. So Father, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit down upon you uh, and the Holy Spirit down upon all those who are here tonight um, so that they may, their hearts may be opened and uh, receive the full message uh, that Hugh has to offer. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Also, I would like to point out my number one helper, and that's my wife, Janine. Uh, stand up, Janine. I do. That's right. 
Thank you. That's kind of like a joke. That was my next joke. Okay. So, um, I just want to introduce uh, Hugh now. Tonight we have the blessing and privilege of having Hugh. Hugh Owen, uh, he is the director of uh, the Colby Center for the Study of Creation. Hugh uh, traveled, as I mentioned, to Wisconsin uh, through Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, but he's from Virginia. Uh, he is the convert son of Sir David Owen, a former assistant secretary general and charter member of the United Nations and secretary general of the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Hugh attended Princeton University, where at the age of 18 he was baptized, confirmed, and made his first Holy Communion in the Princeton University Chapel on Easter Vigil in 1972. Hugh's wife, Maria, was a member of the first class of women at Princeton. She and Hugh were married in 1973, and Maria made her profession of faith in the Catholic Church in 1975. He received a, a BA in Honors in History from New York University and an MS in Education and Supervision and Administration from the Bank Street College of Education in New York City. He also received a permanent license to be a principal or superintendent of schools in the state of New York. Between 1977 and 1991, Hugh worked as a teacher and administrator of several independent schools and served as a school evaluator for the Middle States Association and as a member of the Executive Committee of the New Jersey Association of Independent Schools. For the past 15 years, Hugh has dedicated his life to the service of the church as a writer, an editor, teacher, and lecturer. He has written numerous books and articles on Catholic and secular topics. His books and articles have been published by the Catholic Distance University, Human Life International, Seton Homeschool, The Apostolate for Family Consecration, Latin Mass Magazine, and many other publications. For 13 years, he served as Director of Religious Education for the St. John Bosco Parish in the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia. He is currently the director of the St. The John Paul II Institute of Christian Spirituality and the founder and director of the Colby Center for the Study of Creation in Mount Jackson, Virginia. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Hugh Owen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's a great joy to be here. My mother's mother grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, I'm hoping on this trip to find out something about that part of my heritage, because it's kind of a mystery to me. Um, my topic is fiat creation and the culture of life. Fiat creation means that God created all the different kinds of creatures by fiat, by willing them into existence. When St. Jerome translated the Hebrew of Genesis 1, he, tra he, tra he uses the word fiat, fiat look. So it's the idea that God created all the different kinds of creatures by willing them into existence, not through any kind of natural process, and he created everything for us in the beginning. Now, I have to tell you a little bit about myself so you can understand something of my background and what brings me here. This is a picture of me with my father that was taken a few years ago. <laughs> my father was the son of a Baptist minister in Wales and brought up in a very good Christian home. But when he went away to university in England, his professors enlightened him and told him that we don't need the fairy tales in the book of Genesis. Science can explain everything, the origins of man, the universe. Evolution can explain all of these things without God. And like millions of other people then and now, my father was robbed of his faith and became a secular humanist. Uh, he went on to become the first chartered member of the United Nations. As you heard, he became the uh, co-administrator of the United Nations Development Program. 
He was knighted by the Queen for his work with the UN, and then he retired, uh, frustrated because he saw that all the problems of the world were much worse than they had been when the United Nations was started. So once again, to the intelligentsia, and they had the answer. They said the reason the United Nations is not making headway in solving the world's problems is it's not going to the root of all the world's problems, overpopulation, too many people. That's why they said we have economic and social problems. We need to cut down on the number of people, then we'll have enough to go around and all our problems will be solved. So my father accepted to become the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one provider of abortion as well as contraception and sex education. And my father held that position for just about a year when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack in London when I was just 16 years old. His death precipitated my conversion to the Catholic faith, but that's, that's a whole other story. All I can say for now is that less than two years after he died, I was baptized, confirmed, and made my first Holy Communion as a Catholic in the Princeton University Chapel where I was enrolled as a freshman. The chaplains at uh, Princeton, the Catholic chaplains at that time, were Jesuit priests. And the book that they gave me to teach me the Catholic faith was the Dutch Catechism. I call it the Dutch Cataclysm because this is the book that destroyed the faith of a once great Catholic people. And in this book there's a theme that subtly runs through the entire work and that is that we are now in a scientific age and in our scientific age science has enlightened us about many things and now we understand many things that the church has taught in a new light and so throughout the book the authors sow doubt in the minds of the reader about everything from the existence of angels to the intrinsic evil of contraception and everything in between. But I meekly accepted this, as do most young people when they are taught similar things in most Catholic schools and universities all over the world, until, by the grace of God, about 15 years later, I was running a school and I hired somebody to teach natural science who actually didn't believe that molecules turned into human bodies through billions of years of the same material processes that are going on now. And this was a shock to me because throughout my entire education, I'd never heard so much as a doubt expressed about the Darwinian dogma. And this ignited an explosion in my soul, and I was determined to find out where the truth lay. So for the next 10 years, when I wasn't helping my wonderful wife to raise, at that point it was, I think, five, then six, then seven, then eight, then nine beautiful children that God has blessed us with, I researched every aspect of the creation-evolution controversy. And at the end of the 10 years, I came to the same conclusion as St. Maximilian Kolbe. You know, it's heartbreaking. At the very moment when my father was being robbed of his faith by this evolutionary indoctrination, St. Maximilian Kolbe was recognizing that the emperor of evolution was not wearing any clothes. And he was able to do this because he was not only a great theologian with a doctorate in philosophy, he also loved natural science. And so St. Maximilian Kolbe was able to evaluate the claims of the evolutionary hypothesis as a theologian, as a philosopher, and as a natural scientist. And so, as my father and millions of others were having their faith destroyed by this evolutionary indoctrination, St. Maximilian Kolbe was writing articles in his publications and sending them all over the world showing that the emperor of evolution was not wearing any clothes. Now before I get into this presentation, there's something very important that I need to explain. The original title for this talk was Creationism and the Culture of Life. But when many people hear the word creationism, 
they automatically think that this is some kind of fundamentalism that originated at the end of the 19th century in the United States. In fact, there are prominent Catholic intellectuals who go all over the world saying that this idea that you can take the first chapters of Genesis literally, that never existed in the Catholic Church. That was invented by some fundamentalists here in the United States at the end of the 19th century. So here's a little um, introduction that I think is important for me to make. Here we see Pope Pius XI, and we have a quotation from his encyclical Casti Canubi in 1930, in which he reminds the bishops and faithful of the entire world that the constant teaching of the Church from the time of the Apostles has been that contraception is intrinsically evil, a sin against nature, which brought the punishment of death to Onan in Genesis 38. And uh, Pope Pius XI quotes St. Augustine, who speaks with, in one voice with all the Church Fathers in saying that God took Onan's life because he tried to prevent the act of union proper to married persons from bringing new life into the world. Now, there's a very profound significance to this incident, which is almost never mentioned, and that is that Tamar, the woman with whom Onan was supposed to raise up seed because his brother had not given offspring to the family through Tamar. Tamar is the first woman ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what God is telling us is, Every act of contraception is preventing Jesus Christ from coming into the world. That's what it is. Now, in the entire history of Christianity, all the apostles, all the church fathers, all the doctors, all the popes, and all the principal leaders of every single Christian community in the entire world has interpreted Genesis 38 in the same way. That contraception, that it teaches us that contraception is intrinsically evil. It's a grave sin against the natural law, against God, against human dignity, and against the dignity of holy marriage. Imagine, please, for just a moment, a little thought experiment. Imagine that Lucifer managed to get some very intelligent people first to believe and then to propagate the lie that this interpretation of Genesis, Genesis 38 never existed, never existed in the, in the whole church until the end of the 18th century, and that it originated with John Wesley. That would be a pretty, pretty good trip, wouldn't it? Because then the whole Catholic community would easily be convinced, well, this, isn't, this doctrine isn't part of our patrimony. <laughs> this was invented by some people who were outside of the Catholic Church. Why should we take this seriously? Now, we know that didn't happen with the interpretation of Genesis 38, but I'm going to demonstrate to you, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that that is exactly what has happened with the Catholic understanding of Genesis 1-11. It wasn't very many years ago when the successor of St. Peter was alarmed that the Freemasons and the enemies of the Church were trying to destroy the foundations of Christian civilization by introducing legal divorce into Catholic countries where it was prohibited by law. So the Holy Father published an entire encyclical on holy marriage. And he told the bishops of the whole world, you must defend holy marriage on this foundation. And then he wrote these words, we recall what is known to all and cannot be denied by anyone. 
that God on the sixth day of creation, having formed man's body from the slime of the earth, having breathed into his face the breath of life, gave him a companion whom he miraculously took from the side of Adam when he was locked in sleep. So the vicar of Christ on earth says, the only foundation on which you can defend holy marriage is this, that from the beginning of creation, God created one man, body and soul, for one woman who was created from the man's body, one woman for one man for life from the beginning of creation. So how can it be that what the successor of St. Peter said not very long ago is known to everyone and cannot be denied by anyone is today known by so few of our children and grandchildren and denied by most of their teachers. If you go through the four Holy Gospels and you highlight every place where our Lord Jesus Christ talks about anything in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which are the chapters that bring us from creation to the Tower of Babel, you will find that every time our Lord talks about anything in these first 11 chapters, He speaks of it as true history. When He speaks about Adam and Eve, He speaks of them as real people who were created in a state of perfect harmony at the beginning of creation not billions of years after the beginning of the universe. When he speaks about Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, he locates him at the foundation of the world, which is an expression in Holy Scripture and in the Fathers, which means the beginning of the universe, not just the beginning of human history. And when our Lord works His miracles, He always acts in the same way that He acted in the beginning, when with the Father and the Holy Spirit, He spoke the heavens and the earth the seas and all they contain into existence. For example, when he went to the tomb of Lazarus, Lazarus was going on four days a rotting corpse. A rotting corpse is just a disorganized mess of chemicals. But when our Lord went to that disorganized mess of chemicals and said, come out! In a split second, he raised it up the body of a living, breathing human being. And every believing Jew knew that this is exactly what God did in the beginning. He took matter from the earth, He formed it into the body of the perfect man, Adam, breathed into him the breath of life, and made him the king of a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious universe. And this is how the people knew that our Lord was God in the flesh because the character of God does not change as he acted in the beginning that's how he acted when he walked the earth and that's how he acts today through the sacraments and through the members of the mystical body of Christ where there is living faith two ecumenical councils of the Catholic Church Trent and Vatican I teach that when all the fathers of the church agree on any interpretation of Scripture that pertains to a doctrine of faith or morals that is the truth and we must believe it. And all of the fathers of the church, without exception, believed and taught that Genesis is a sacred history, not a myth, not a poem, but a sacred history, a true account of what actually happened at the beginning of the world. They all taught that God created all the different kinds of creatures for man, by willing them into existence, not through any kind of natural process. That He created Adam body and soul, that He created Eve from Adam's side, and then He placed them as the king and queen of a perfectly beautiful, complete and harmonious universe that was totally free, not only from human death, but from deformity, disease, or any kind of disorder of that kind. And that it was only the original sin that brought the human death and deformity and disease and man harming natural disasters and all these disorders into the world. And that's why all the fathers agreed with St. Augustine that in this creation had no one sinned, the world would have been filled and beautified with nature's good without exception. And this is why St. Paul teaches in Roman 8, Romans 8 that the whole universe was affected by the original sin of Adam, not just the earth, but the entire universe was made subject to
to a bondage to decay because of the original sin that took place on the earth. Now if we had time, I could show you that all of the liturgical traditions of the church, all the fathers, all the doctors, all the magisterial teaching from the patristic era, it all teaches this same doctrine. But I don't have time to do that, so I'm just going to give you one other example which I think you'll find very interesting. The Seventh Ecumenical Council defined against the iconoclasts in 787 AD that the holy icons approved by the bishops of the church to be placed in the churches to teach illiterate people their faith, teach with authority in accordance with the Word of God that's preached from the pulpits. Many Catholics in our part of the world do not realize that all sacred art was iconographic in the early church. It was only in the late Middle Ages that sacred art in the West became naturalistic. This icon here is from Monreale Cathedral in Sicily, made a metropolitan cathedral by the Pope at the end of the 12th century, so that illiterate people could learn their faith by simply looking at these holy icons. Now, I'm a Byzantine Catholic, so in our tradition, these holy icons are still absolutely central to our liturgy. And what the Catholic Church teaches is an, a holy icon is not a nice picture to decorate your church. A holy icon makes present to you the reality of what it, of what it represents. And therefore, if we understood this holy icon correctly as Catholics, we would understand that it's making present to us the reality of God's creation of Adam. And I think it's perfectly obvious that the first Adam was created in the perfect image and likeness of the last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, body and soul, by being willed into existence. This is the icon of the fifth day of creation from Monreale Cathedral. We don't see reptiles sprouting wings and becoming birds. We don't see land mammals going out to sea and becoming whales. We don't see a common ancestor of anything turning into two different kinds of creatures. We see what cutting-edge 21st century genetics tells us is the reality that God created all the different kinds of creatures, not every breed of dog, but all the different kinds of creatures by willing them into existence. And which, icon, which day of creation is represented here? This is the most important icon of all for our purposes because this is the icon of the seventh day from Monreale Cathedral. And I say it's the most important one because theistic evolution, the idea that God used an evolutionary process over hundreds of millions and billions of years to evolve the bodies of the first human beings, it comes in a variety of forms, but they all deny this truth, which was proclaimed by all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers in their authoritative teaching. And that truth is that when God created all the different kinds of creatures, He created them for us in our first parents. And therefore, when He finished creating Adam and Eve, He stopped creating new kinds of creatures. And all the different kinds of creatures existed together at the same time, each one perfect according to its nature, in perfect harmony with Adam and Eve, who were created in a state of exalted holiness in perfect harmony with God. That is what this holy icon teaches, and that is what every form of evolutionary thinking denies. And of course, the reason that it's denied is the reason that I was given in the Dutch Cataclysm by the Jesuit fathers who received me into the church. I was made to believe that we're in the scientific age. The fathers, they were good, holy, wise men, but they didn't have our technology, they didn't have our advanced scientific knowledge, so of course God had to give them this myth that we find in Genesis. 
And I meekly accepted that as millions of Catholic young people have been meekly accepting it for decades all over the world. But by the grace of God, about 15 years later, I came to the realization that this is one of the most absurd claims ever made by human beings. And I can prove it to you with one slide. Because this is the icon of human evolution. And minus the McDonald's man, this is what we find in Catholic schools and universities in their biology textbooks all over the world. But the only thing that's scientific about this icon is the McDonald's man. Because what science tells us is that we are not evolving, we are devolving. So the progression from Adam to the McDonald's man is confirmed by scientific evidence. The rest of this has no basis in any field of knowledge whatsoever. But that's not my point. My point here is, you don't need to know anything about science to understand what this icon is saying. You don't need to know anything about anything to understand what this icon is saying. Three-year-olds look at this and understand what it's saying. So do you see that this claim that Moses and the Church Fathers couldn't understand evolution is one of the most absurd propositions that's ever come out of a human mouth. Because if this is what God did, He could have shown this to Moses, He could have shown this to St. Bridget of Sweden and Venerable Maria of Agreda and all the great mystical saints who were shown the work of creation. And then on the walls of our cathedrals, we would have beautiful mosaics of reptiles turning into birds and land mammals turning into whales, and a common ancestor of chimps and humans turning into Adam. The reason we don't see those things in our churches is not because ancient people were too stupid to understand evolution. It's because this is a fantasy invented by proud human beings, as we shall see in a moment, who could not accept that there are some things that we cannot figure out with our own unaided, unaided intellects by extrapolating from our very limited experience of a fallen world. Things that we can only know through divine revelation. Now, if you still don't believe that I'm correctly representing what the Catholic Church has taught from the time of the Apostles, you can lay your doubts to rest very easily. Just go online and look up the Catechism of the Council of Trent, or the Roman Catechism. This is the most important catechism in the history of the Catholic Church. It was mandated by a sitting ecumenical council, presided over by a canonized saint, and written for the pastors of the church to teach their illiterate people the dogmas of the faith, not the fine points of theology the dogmas of the faith. And it's the only catechism that's quoted in the New Catechism, and it's quoted 20 times, because it is filled with beautiful, clear, precise explanations of all the principal dogmas of the faith. And this catechism has been praised by more popes, more doctors, more great saints than all other catechisms in the history of the church put together. And for 350 years, this was the gold standard for teaching and preaching in the entire world. The people who brought the faith here, like Bishop Barga, this is what they preached. This is what they taught. The people who gave their blood, sweat, and tears so that we could have the Catholic faith over here lived by this, and this is what they taught. And if you look up how this catechism explains the dogma of creation, when it explains the first article of the creed, this is what you'll see. The divinity created all things in the beginning, not just hydrogen, helium, and lithium. He spoke and they were made, no natural process. He commanded and they were created, everything by fiat. And it goes on to explain this is how God created all the different kinds of plants. This is how he created all the different heavenly bodies. This is how he creates all the different 
kinds of creatures of the sea and of the air and of the land. And this is how he creates Adam and Eve. And notice what it says here. It says, if the illiterate pastor wants to teach his people how God created the world and what happened in the first era of human history, all he has to do is refer to the sacred history of Genesis and teach that to the people. Nowadays, I know, I've seen it in many theology classes or RCIA classes. Students are given the impression that if if you want to understand Genesis, it's a challenge. You, probably you should have a degree in Biblical Hebrew, maybe a degree in, in theology, and then maybe you could begin to get a handle on it. That is not the mind of the Catholic Church. The mind of the Catholic Church is expressed here. If you can read, and if you have a Catholic Bible, all you have to do is open it up and read what it says in Genesis and believe it, and now you understand exactly how God created the heavens and the earth, the seas, and all they contain. That is the true mind of the Catholic Church, just as it was the true mind of the fathers and doctors who went before. But the devil has always hated this doctrine. Because the devil knows that this doctrine is the foundation of the Christian civilization that our Lord Jesus Christ came to establish. Because if you believe in this doctrine, you know that God, who is almighty, all-loving, and all-wise, created for you a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious universe. And that it was only sin that brought the death, deformity, disease, and disorders into this world. The devil doesn't want you to believe that. The devil wants you to make God responsible for all the disorders in creation. And he wants definitely to sow every possible doubt in your mind about the trustworthiness of the revelation that God gave to Moses as it has been believed in his church from the beginning. And so the Holy Spirit inspired St. Peter, the first pope, to warn us in one of the most amazing prophetic passages in the entire Bible, to warn us about the evolution. I encourage you to look it up, 2 Peter chapter 3, where St. Peter prophesies that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the word of God in Genesis, and saying, things have always been the same from the beginning of creation. That's why I have those words in bold and italics. St. Peter ran a fishing business. He wasn't a philosopher. But inspired by God, he sums up the premise that lies at the foundation of every form of evolutionary thought, whether it's atheistic or theistic. But notice what he goes on to say. He says these scoffers will have to deliberately ignore the fact, not the nice belief, the fact that it was the Word of God, the fiat, that brought the heavens and the earth and all they contain into existence. Not a material process, like a supernova explosion. And he says they will also have to deny the fact that there was a divine judgment upon the entire world with the Noachic flood, which so changed the face of the earth that we can't even look at the earth as it is today and know what it looked like before the Noachic flood. And here's where the prophecy begins to be fulfilled. Not with Darwin, with the so-called Enlightenment philosophers. It's very difficult for us to find theistic evolutionists who will have a debate with us in a public forum. Last year, we were able to have one, and Dr. Miller, Dr. Ken Miller, one of the leading Catholic theistic evolutionists in the world, and three other people came down to debate with my colleague, Dr. Thomas Seiler, a physicist from Germany, at a state-of-the-art facility in Sanford University. In that state-of-the-art facility, I got to this slide when it was my turn to speak and the power went out. The power did not go out for anybody else. The power did not go out on any other slide. The power went out on this slide. It's not the only time it happened to me. 
Last year, we were in Uganda. I was giving a presentation. I got to this slide and the power went out. It didn't go out for anybody else and it didn't go out for any other slide. It went out for this slide. Because this is the slide that the devil does not want you to understand more than anything else in this entire presentation. You see, René Descartes was the first baptized Catholic scoffer to begin to be taken seriously when after dabbling in the occult, Rosicrucianism, and having three mystical dreams in which he said a spirit of truth possessed him, he proposed that it was more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature like stars or plants or animals in terms of the same natural processes that are going on now instead of this strange idea that things just popped into existence whole and complete in the beginning. Well, Descartes' books were put on the index by the church authorities then, but that didn't stop his ideas from insinuating themselves little by little into the minds of the intellectual elite of the entire Western world. Now Blaise Pascal was every bit a great as gen a genius as René Descartes, but the difference was Blaise Pascal actually loved our Lord Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. And he saw that if Descartes' false philosophy were ever widely accepted, it would bring untold misery to humanity. And so he made this amazing <coughs> prophetic statement in Pensée. He says, I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he tried to dispense with God. Oh, he could not help making him start the world in motion with a flip of his thumb. The Big Bang, if you will. After that, he had no more use for God. What an amazing insight. He saw that if we assume that things have always been the same from the beginning of the universe, the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in the same way from the beginning of the universe, then all we need God for is just to start everything going. Then we can forget about Him. Because if things have always been the same, well, with our wonderful minds, all we have to do is study what's going on now, and from that we extrapolate all the way back and we can figure it all out for ourselves. We don't need any revelation from God. And that's what sets the stage for phase two of the evolution revolution. It's not Darwin yet. It's the geologists. James Hutton and Charles Lyell are the geological revolutionaries who embrace the false Enlightenment philosophy of Descartes and make their guiding principle the present is the key to the past. That's logical, right? If things have always been the same from the beginning, then by studying the present, we can figure out what happened in the past. There's only one problem. It's not only wrong, it's the opposite of the truth. Because in reality, if you want to understand the present, there are three supernatural facts which you have to accept. You have to understand. Number one, there was a supernatural creation which was finished with the creation of Adam and Eve. God stopped creating new kinds of creatures. At that point, we can't observe it. Number two, there was a supernatural divine judgment on the universe at the time of the original sin. We can't observe that. And number three, there was a supernatural divine judgment on the world at the time of the flood, and we can't observe that either. That was an unrepeatable, unique historical event. So the reality is, if you want us to understand the present, the past, as given to us in perfect truth in the sacred history of Genesis, is the key to understanding the present. But what did the devil do? He got some of the smartest people who ever lived to believe something that is the opposite of the truth and to make that their guiding principle in everything that they did. You have to hand it to him. He is a clever spirit. So what did Lyell do with this false principle from Descartes? Well, in those days, being a geologist was not what it means today. Today, we actually have huge laboratories 
where sedimentologists can do experimental research and study how sediments are actually laid down in the real world. They didn't have anything like that. Being a geologist in those days meant taking walks in the country, looking at the rocks and speculating about how they might have formed. And so Lyle imagined that since we don't see anything like a global flood, that must just be a fairy tale. What we see are just local, slow and gradual processes. So that's what, have, that's what must have resulted in all the sedimentary rock formations that we see all over the earth. So we imagine that great bodies of water came over the land, sediments settled out, the waters withdrew, the sediments set hardened into rock, and then this happened over and over again over eons of time. And if that were true, if that's how most sedimentary rocks form, and it isn't, then of course, when you examine the great sedimentary rock formations all over the earth, like the Grand Canyon, then you could be sure that the layer at the top must have formed very recently, and the ones at the bottom must have formed eons ago. And if that were true, which it isn't, well then of course the fossils in the rocks would seem to tell the story of life developing from the simpler to the more complex, from the fish to the amphibian, to the reptile, to the bird, to the mammal, and finally, man. And that's where we get Darwin. Darwin's wild speculations in biology are completely based on Lyell and Hutton's wild speculations in geology, which are totally based on Descartes' false philosophy, which he got from the spirit of truth, alias Lucifer. It's a house of cards. But that's what gives us the tree of death which adorns biology textbooks in Catholic schools and universities all over the world. And this should never be called the Tree of Life because it's 550 plus million years of death and destruction which are apparently required to get us from the bottom to the top of the tree so that we can have human evolution. Well, it's time for some relief from all this depressing <laughs> barrage of error piled upon error. So I'm happy to tell you that the same Blessed Virgin Mary that our Lord Jesus Christ gave to be our mother when he was dying for us on the cross came down from heaven in 1858 to warn us against the diabolical deception of human evolution and to actually give the lie to this diabolical deception and she did it with these few words when Saint Bernadette asked her at Lourdes who are you and she said I am the Immaculate Conception it was Saint Maximilian who meditated on these words most of his life and the last thing that he wrote before he was taken to a starvation bunker at Auschwitz concentration camp was on the meaning of these words. And what St. Maximilian realized is with these words in 1858 on the very eve of the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species in 1859 our Blessed Mother affirmed the true Catholic doctrine of creation and gave the lie to the diabolical deception of human evolution. And this is how he explains it. He, Adam, he says, was not conceived in the womb of a mother. He was created, body and soul. He goes on. Eve was not conceived in the womb of a mother. She was created from Adam's body. He continues. Our Lord Jesus Christ did not begin to exist in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He's God. He existed from eternity. Therefore, St. Maximilian concludes, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the unique, one and only, immaculate conception. But here's the thing. If theistic evolution is true, what's being taught in most Catholic schools and universities all over the world, Adam was conceived in the womb of a subhuman primate. So was Eve. And since theistic evolutionists are still bound to accept the dogma of original sin as defined at the Council of Trent, they have to hold that Adam and Eve were conceived without sin. Therefore, if human evolution were true, 
the theistic version of it, the Blessed Virgin would have had to say, I was immaculately conceived, or I am an immaculate conception, or I am immaculate conception number three. But she didn't say that. She said, I am the immaculate conception because Adam and Eve were not conceived, they were created. Now believe it or not, after all these things that we've talked about had gone on, the Pope and the bishops were extremely alarmed by the spread of these false enlightenment notions that were beginning to infect the minds of many Catholic intellectuals. And at the First Vatican Council, a very important anathema was pronounced against one of the principal errors of Descartes and the Enlightenment philosophers. I could literally spend my whole life crying in front of the tabernacle because so few Catholics even know that this anathema exists. But as the old saying goes, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Just because we don't know that this anathema exists doesn't mean that it loses its force. It doesn't. And this is what it says. It says, if anyone says that it is possible that to the dogmas declared by the church, a meaning must sometimes be attributed according to the progress of science, different from that which the church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. This is amazing. What this is saying is, there is nothing that we will ever learn in astronomy or geology or biology or any other branch of science which will ever contradict any dogma of the faith as it was understood at that moment and as it had been understood up until then. So someone could say to me, well, how do you know how the doctrine of creation was defined at that moment? Very easily, <laughs> because at the very moment that this anathema was pronounced, the Catechism of Trent was mandated for the teaching and preaching of the faith throughout the entire world. So the dogma of creation as defined in the Roman Catechism is exactly what is meant, was in the minds of the fathers of Vatican I when they pronounced this anathema. Which means there's nothing we will ever learn in astronomy, biology, or geology that is true that will ever contradict the dogma of creation as it is defined in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Now, Pope Leo XIII obviously understood it that way. Didn't he tell the bishops of the whole world 11 years later, this is the only foundation on which you can defend holy marriage, that God created Adam, body and soul, on the sixth day of creation, and created Eve from Adam's side, one man for one woman for life from the beginning of creation. But look what happens. Two years later, Father Vigarou, one of the leading scripture scholars in the whole wide world, Catholic, goes into print saying, geology has established that creation was not simultaneous. In other words, excuse me, Holy Father, you are not keeping up with the latest scientific discoveries. God couldn't have created everything by willing it into existence in the beginning because geology has proven that this happened over millions and millions and millions of years. And then he goes on to make this amazing statement. It was reserved to our time to discover the true meaning of the cosmogonic days. That means the true meaning of the day in Genesis 1. Think about that. Father Vigarou is saying, the fathers, the doctors, St. Thomas, the popes, the council fathers, when it comes to this stuff, they were all nincompoops. But thanks to Descartes, Lyle, and Darwin, we finally got it right. Well, thanks be to God, Pope Leo XIII didn't just meekly bow his head to the consensus view among natural scientists. On the contrary, he founded the Pontifical Biblical Commission to combat the arrogant modernism of people like Father Vigarou. And Pope St. Pius X, who came after Pope Leo XIII, made the PBC an arm of the magisterium. And he said, if you dissent from its decrees, you are guilty of grave sin. 
And in 1909, the PBC answered eight questions with respect to the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. And in one of the answers, they declared this, that no Catholic can deny three facts that pertain to the foundations of the Catholic religion, the Christian religion. Number one, the creation by God of all things in the beginning of time. Not just some things that turned into other things. We're supposed to believe that God created all things in the beginning of time. Number two, we are to believe that Adam was a special creation. That means he was created body and soul. And we are to believe that Eve was created from Adam's side. Now it's tragic that most of our young people never even learn about this. And if they are told about it, they will be told, but the PBC was just an advisory body. This is not binding. We don't hold to this anymore. But that's not true. Name an advisory body in the church today whose decrees are binding under pain of mortal sin. It doesn't exist. But you can easily verify for yourselves that at the time this decree was pronounced, the Pope himself said that if you dissented from this, you were guilty of grave sin. And Pope St. Pius X saw exactly what was coming. In his great encyclical Pascendi, he said, we are now confronted with the worst heresy in the history of Christianity, modernism. Many Catholics know that much. But you will almost never hear what he identifies in the very same encyclical as the principal doctrine of the worst heresy in the history of the church. He says, the principal dogma of the modernists is evolution. Now why is modernism the worst heresy and why is evolution its principal dogma? This is very important to understand. You see, all other heresies in the history of the church took some doctrine and added to it or subtracted from it or twisted it, but they left most of the faith intact. Modernism doesn't do that. Because modernism is based on the idea that everything is evolving. Therefore, everything is in flux. Therefore, there is no immutable truth. And there are no stable natures. And the Pope saw that if this evolution-based modernism <laughs> spreads within the Catholic community, they're going to say everything has to change. The liturgy will have to be changed. The dogmas will have to be changed. The law of the church will have to be changed. Because they'll say, look, the law that was good for us 500 years ago, that's totally inadequate for today. We've evolved into a new situation. The doctrine that was good in the Middle Ages is inadequate. Science has enlightened us so much, we've evolved into a new era. And he saw everything's going to be destroyed. Not, when they're done, he prophesied, nothing will be left. It will be total devastation. And we can see that his prophetic vision has unfortunately been very much realized. And that brings us to the last authoritative magisterial teaching on evolution, which was the encyclical Humani Generis in 1950 of Pope Pius XII. Now again, it's heartbreaking that most Catholic young people are taught that Humani Generis allowed Catholics to believe and teach evolution. I'm sorry, that is another lie from the pit of hell. Read the encyclical, you will not find that anywhere. What you will find is the Pope telling the bishops, you must teach that all of Genesis is true history, including the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. You will find him saying, you must teach that every word of Scripture is true, not just when it talks about faith and morals, but also when it talks about history or anything else. Now think about it. If he commands the bishops to teach that Genesis 1 to 11 is history, 
and he commands the bishops to teach that every historical statement of the Bible is true, how do we get theistic evolution out of that? But that's not all. He also tells them, you must maintain the metaphysical principles of traditional Catholic philosophy in your examination of the evolutionary hypothesis. And we'll see how important that is in just a moment. The only permission that he gives is for Catholic experts in theology, philosophy, and natural science to examine the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis. The problem is he wasn't obeyed. Where did we have this open debate? <laughs> it's never happened. And who's obeying those very important mandates that are contained in Humani Generis? Very few. Now, we are told again and again that Pope St. John Paul II made many statements favorable to the idea that there's a lot of scientific evidence that a one-celled organism did evolve into the body of the first human being through some kind of evolutionary process. But what the people <coughs> who bring this up do not mention in almost every case are two extremely important points. Number one, every statement by Pope St. John Paul II or any recent pope favorable to the evolutionary hypothesis has been made of it as a hypothesis in natural science. The dogma of papal infallibility was defined very precisely at Vatican I. It specifically states, the Holy Father does not have this gift to define new doctrine, but only to define a doctrine of faith or morals that is contained in the deposit of faith that was handed down from the apostles. There is no statement, it doesn't exist, there's no statement by Pope St. John Paul II or any recent pope where he finds evolution in the deposit of faith. So that's the first point. But the second point is much more important than that one. And that is that when he does teach in the area of faith and morals, Pope St. John Paul II tells the bishops, the theologians, the philosophers, to do certain things which if we obey Pope St. John Paul II will lead inevitably to the rejection of the evolutionary hypothesis. Specifically in Fides et Ratio, he repeats the call of Pope Pius XII in Humani Generis, which he footnotes, to maintain the metaphysical principles of traditional Catholic philosophy in the examination of the evolutionary hypothesis. Now, I'm happy to be able to tell you that we can take pride in the fact that an American theologian and philosopher is one of the few in the whole wide world who actually obeyed Pope St. John Paul II and Pope Pius XII and took the metaphysical principles of traditional Catholic philosophy and brought them to bear on an examination of the evolutionary hypothesis. And that is Father Chad Ripperger, who was professor of dogmatic theology at the Fraternity of St. Peter's Seminary and has a PhD in philosophy. In his amazing book, Metaphysics and Evolution, which we have on our website, he obeys Pope St. John Paul II and Pope Pius XII, and he takes these metaphysical principles and he evaluates the claims of the evolutionary hypothesis against them. Now, I don't have time to go through all the principles, but I don't need to, because these are fundamental principles of common sense and reason. So, the teaching of the church is any hypothesis or any system of thought that violates even one of these principles is bogus. You don't need to waste your time examining it any further. So we'll just take this principle, no effect is greater than its cause. This is just common sense. All these principles are common sense. If we didn't live by them, we'd have to be locked up in a psychiatric hospital. All it means is if I have a balance scale and I have a 10 pound weight here and I put a five pound weight here, here, it's not going to balance because if it did, the effect balancing the scale would be greater than the cause, which was putting a five pound weight to balance a ten pound weight. That's all it's saying. 
Now, if you examine the true Catholic doctrine of creation, there's no contradiction. Because God, who's the supreme being, brings into existence many different kinds of beings that are less in being than He is. So the effect is never greater than the cause. No problem. But as Father Ripperger shows, when we actually obey Pope St. John Paul II and apply this principle to evolution, we come to the shocking realization that from beginning to end, it's one continuous orgy of violations of what Pope St. John Paul II tells us is a fundamental principle that can never be violated. Think about it. Dr. Ken Miller is convinced that in the 21st century, scientists are going to figure out how matter came alive. Now, it's never going to happen, but evolution in its pure form, if you will, requires that it did happen. Apparently, what that kind of theistic evolutionist believes is we only need, needed God for the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, and then everything else could, could just happen through material processes. Well, I would say that the jump from not being alive to being alive is a, a pretty big case of the effect being considerably greater than the cause. But that's not where it stops. That's only the beginning. Because at every single step of the way, in order for evolution to happen, the effect always has to be greater than the cause. That's evolution by definition. So think about it. What we are allowing to be taught to most Catholic young people in Catholic schools and universities all over the world is a flagrant violation of fundamental metaphysical principles which Pope St. John Paul II himself tells us cannot be violated. How could this have happened? Well, the answer is that there's been confusion injected into this picture. And this is how it's been done. We have plenty of people who look at this and who say, well, we're not, we're not like Richard Dawkins and Carl Sagan. We know that molecules couldn't turn into a human body all by themselves. God had to provide the power to make the jumps happen. But do you see what that is? That's a bait and switch. Because Darwin and T.H. Huxley and Julian Huxley and Carl Sagan and Richard Dawkins, they present this to us as a hypothesis in natural science. By definition, it has to be able to explain everything that we see without having God come down and work miracles. The minute that I need God to come down and work a miracle to preserve my hypothesis, that's not science, that's religion. But because of this kind of muddled thinking, we have made God the savior of a bankrupt, bogus hypothesis. We've, made, we've literally made God the savior of evolution. But God did not come into this world to save evolution. He came into the world to save us from evolution. If you go back and study what was going on in the time of the church fathers, the pagan intellectuals were full of evolutionary ideas. Epicurus, Lucretius, they were the leading philosophers, and they believed everything evolved through material processes, struggle for existence over millions and millions of years. It's nothing new. And the fathers of the church had to fight against that, and they stood by the sacred history of Genesis. They didn't say, well, these guys are really smart. We want them on our side. Let's find a way to compromise. This isn't important after all. They never did that. No one did that. Every father of the church would have died for the literal truth of every proposition in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And yet now, we are literally paying people all over the world to teach our children something that destroys the foundations of their faith. Now, um, I'm going to wrap up this part, and then I'm going to just take a few minutes to give you a couple of examples of how sound natural science actually confirms the sacred history of Genesis, especially with regard to the creation of Adam and Eve, and why it is absolutely necessary to restore this doctrine if we are going to defeat the anti-culture of death and lay the foundations 
for a culture of life. This is Giotto's beautiful painting of the first sign that Jesus did when he changed water into wine. Now the church fathers who were more intelligent than we are, and that's a genetic fact because we've had over a thousand years of genetic degradation since the time of the church fathers, they recognized that it was a very significant detail that St. John gives us when he says there were six containers of water. Why six containers of water? Why not ten? Why not five? Why not three? Because the Father saw that our Lord Jesus Christ wanted us to understand that the power by which He willed water to change instantaneously into wine, which had all the appearance of a long history that it didn't actually possess, that it hadn't actually gone through, was the same divine power by which He willed into existence the heavens and the earth and all they contain, including a mature Adam who, if you met him two seconds after he was created, you would have thought he was 25 or 30 years old. But I want you to imagine that we could go back in time to the wedding banquet and that you're reclining at table next to a first century skeptic. We'll call him Epicurus. There were plenty of skeptics in those days. And you've just been served this miraculous wine and Epicurus is raving about it. He says, this is the most wonderful wine I've ever tasted. You've got to tell me where it came from. You say, well, Epicurus, this is going to be hard for you to accept. But the prophet from Nazareth held up his hand over the water that we use for washing ourselves and it turned into what you're drinking now. Well, Epicurus isn't going to accept that. He says, look, I know something about wine. I have a vineyard of my own. To make a vintage like this, first you would have to care for those vines with great, great care. And then once you had the wine and you fermented it, you would have to have put it in your cellar for a hundred years to make this kind of a vintage. So don't tell me that some prophet from Nazareth held up his hand and changed water into this. Well, now you only have one recourse. So you point out to him, Epicurus, you know Mary of Nazareth and John. You know how upright they are. They'd rather die than tell a lie. They witnessed this miracle. I'll bring them over and they'll tell you. They'll testify to what they saw. So he reluctantly agrees and you bring Our Lady and St. John over. And St. John looks him in the eye and he says, Yes, Brother Epicurus, it's true. Jesus of Nazareth held up his hand and before our eyes the water turned into this wine. Now Epicurus has a choice. He can either say, I do not understand how the prophet from Nazareth, by his word, by willing it, changed ordinary water in an instant into this wine, which has all the appearance of having gone through a long natural history that it doesn't actually possess. But I will believe the testimony of the truthful witness that this is so. Or he can say, I refuse to believe the testimony even of a truthful witness until I can demonstrate for myself in terms of the same material processes that are going on now that I can control that this could be so. And you see, that's the same choice that Almighty God presents to every human being when they're confronted with Genesis chapter 1. We can either say, I don't understand how God by His Word created the heavens and the earth, the seas and all they contain by willing them into existence. But I believe the testimony of the truthful witness Moses as it was believed in God's church from the beginning that this is so. Or we can say, I refuse to believe the testimony of the truthful witness Moses as it was believed in the church from the beginning until I can demonstrate for myself in terms of the same material processes that are going on now that this could be true. That's the choice that we have to make and the stakes are very high. Oh my goodness. Um, I don't know if somebody who's tech-savvy could save me, but I just ran into um, the satanic forces <laughs> pre pre preventing me from being able to advance my slides. Um, so uh, I've only got a few minutes, so I want to just very quickly uh, 
highlight the fact that when Almighty God works the greatest public miracle since the resurrection on October 13, 1917 at Fatima, Portugal, a miracle that was announced months in advance for a specific time and place witnessed by 70,000 people. There's nothing like it in the last 2,000 years of human history. That miracle was done, the miracle of the sun at Fatima, to confirm that the message of Our Lady of Fatima was urgent and true. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. And um, what Our Lady said is that if her requests were not heeded, if we did not repent and turn back to God and stop offending Him, she said Russia would spread its errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the Church. Now, what most Catholics believe who know about Fatima is that the principal error that took hold in Russia was communism, but that is not correct. The principal error that took hold in Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution was evolutionism. It was faith in evolution that destroyed the faith of Lenin, of Stalin, of Trotsky, of all the principal leaders of the communist revolution and made them confident atheists who were perfectly willing to wipe out tens of millions of people because they stood in the way of what they perceived to be evolutionary progress. Hitler said that the purpose of the Nazi party was to bring evolution to the next phase. Mao Zedong became an evolutionist, and when the Chinese communists took over in China, Bishop O'Gara, who was a Catholic missionary bishop, saw that in every town they would bring people into a hall like this and give them a seminar on evolution. Because if they could get them to believe that they were a product of this material process of evolution, they would know they had no soul, there was no God, there was no afterlife, and they could get them to believe in the whole evolution of the whole communist mumbo jumbo. But as pro life leaders in this community, this is what I want to demonstrate to you as an example of how faith in evolution is anti science and destroys the foundations of the culture of life. In this slide we have a photograph of Father Azam, who was one of the leading lights at Notre Dame University a hundred years ago. He was a theologian, but he was also a natural scientist, and he was something of a celebrity because he was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt, the president. They went down to the Amazon and collected specimens together and things like that. And Father Azam wanted to put Notre Dame on the map as a top-tier university by emphasizing science. And for him that meant embracing evolution. So he began writing books showing how evolution and the Catholic faith went together. And one of his arguments for the truth that a one-celled organism turned into a human being was this. The drawings of the German anatomist Ernst Haeckel who drew a human embryo and then copied it and said that that was the embryo of the fish, the pig, the turtle, the chicken, and the salamander at the same stage of development, and that this was proof that the human embryo goes through all the stages of evolution in the mother's womb. Well, there is a direct line that must be drawn from that terrible day at the beginning of the 20th century when Notre Dame began to embrace theistic evolution and that even more terrible day a hundred years later when Barack Obama, the most pro-abortion political leader in the entire world, walked on stage at Notre Dame and was given an honorary degree why the real Catholics were being handcuffed and taken away, not even allowed to protest this abomination. Because you have to see that without the denigration of the sacred humanity of the unborn child from conception, which theistic evolution always promotes, there would never have been an honorary degree for Barack Obama a hundred years later. Now, here's Sir Julian Huxley, 100 years after the publication of Origin of Species, he is the number one scientist championing evolution in the entire world. My father knew him, he looked up to him, and uh, just about everybody that I, that I knew in my circles thought that he was, he was great. But 100 years 
after Origin of Species, he lays it on the line that embryology gives us the most striking proof for evolution. Think about this. They've had 100 years to come up with the goods and give us some sound evidence that a one-celled organism really did turn into a human body over millions of years. And the leading scientist champion of evolution in the whole world tells us this is it. So let's have a look. Well, what it is, is really nothing more than slight variations on the Ernst Haeckel forgeries from the late 19th century, which, as I'll show you in a moment, are still in biology textbooks in Catholic schools and universities all over the world. But on the bottom row of this slide are the actual photographs of the human embryo and the embryos of the other kinds of creatures at the same stage of development, published in Scientific American more than 20 years ago. And I think you'll agree that real science does not bear any resemblance at all to evolutionary mythology. Not only is the human embryo distinct from all the other kinds of creatures, all the other kinds of creatures are distinct from the others. This is completely against all the predictions of Darwin and T.H. Huxley and Julian Huxley and Carl Sagan and all the rest of them down to the present day. But it agrees perfectly with the sacred history of Genesis where Moses tells us ten times that God created everything to reproduce after its kind. And therefore we would expect that each kind of creature has its own unique pattern of embryonic development and that's exactly what we see. But look at this. Father Karl Rahner was argu arguably the most influential Catholic theologian in Europe in the 20th century. And yet he goes into print in the 1970s that he's convinced that the human embryo goes through all the stages of evolution in the mother's womb. So what happens? Now the people who want to legalize abortion in the first trimester, who want to legalize abortifacient contraception, they can say, look, even Father Ron or even your smartest theologians are smart enough to recognize that evolution is true. How can you people be so stupid as to think that something going through the fish stage deserves all the rights and privileges of a fully developed human being? And this is a 21st century biology textbook, typical of textbooks that you'll find in Catholic schools and universities all over the world, and I'm ashamed to inform you that it was co-authored by a prominent member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And look at the caption. Not only do the drawings look strikingly similar to Ernst Haeckel's 19th century forgeries, the caption tells students that all vertebrates start out with an enlarged head region, gill slits, and a tail. This is complete garbage. What are called gill slits have nothing to do with breathing. They develop into the pharyngeal arches in different parts of your facial anatomy. And the tail is just the base of the developing spine. It doesn't have anything to do with being a relic of when we were reptiles. But what happens to our young people when they're taught this nonsense? They are conditioned to believe that evolution is true and that you don't have a, a complete human being from the moment of conception. And doesn't that help, help to explain why studies show that Catholic young ladies are just about as likely to have abortions in this country as their atheist girlfriends? Because they're taught the same evolution, they, they get the same evolution indoctrination in most of the Catholic schools that they get in the public school. And what's worse, in most of their theology classes, they're told, look, we're not like those ignorant fundamentalists who think they can just open the Bible and believe what it says. We are way more sophisticated than that. We see no problem whatsoever in, in combining evolution and the Catholic faith. And that's why we have what can only be described as the contraceptive holocaust. Because as you know, we have 40 to 50 surgical abortions but by conservative estimates, we have at least five times that many little boys and girls who are being murdered in their mother's womb by different forms of contraception that do not contracept. Quite often they allow conception to happen, but they create such a hostile environment in the mother's womb that the baby dies. 
So our Heavenly Father has to look down on a world in which over one quarter of a billion human beings are snuffed out in their mother's womb. And he listens to hear someone in his church saying something about it, and he hears almost complete silence. And a big factor is that theistic evolution has desensitized us to the sacred humanity of the unborn child. And here's Francis Collins, the founder of Biologos, which is the principal think tank that promotes theistic evolution among Catholic and non-Catholic universities. The, one of the leading theistic evolution websites to Catholic, for Catholics took a lot of money from this entity. But is it a coincidence that Francis Collins and his subsequent leaders who came after him have gone on record saying that they're excited about the breathtaking prospects for embryonic stem cell research. What is embryonic stem cell research? Where you take a tiny little boy or girl, tear them to pieces, and use the parts to benefit some stronger, less vulnerable human being. So if we have the contraceptive holocaust, and we do, it is inseparable from the indoctrination into theistic evolution that has taken place uh, decade after decade for a long time within our own community. So um, I'm just going to close. Oh, I have so many things I would love to share with you, but um, I, I just do not have the time, uh, except if we can do it in the Q&A. But I just want to um, answer this one question because now, people will say, well, in the end, what difference does it make? What difference does it make whether I believe that God created everything the way the church fathers and doctors believed, or he used this long process of evolution? What difference does it make as long as I believe that God did it? And this is the bottom line. St. Thomas Aquinas answered this question a long time ago. In the Summa Contra Gentiles, he teaches that those who say that it doesn't matter what you believe about creation as long as you have a correct opinion of God, he says that is notoriously false because an error about creation is always reflected in an error about God. So what is at stake is the character of God, that's all. If you reflect even on just on what you've heard tonight, you will see that the God of creation is a totally different being than the God, little g, of evolution. The God of creation is the God of life, love, and truth. The God of evolution, little g, if you reflect upon his character, he is the God of death, destruction, and deception. And I, I, want, to, I want to emphasize the deception because now there's a researcher at Georgetown who's specializing in interviewing young Catholics who are leaving the church in droves to find out why they're leaving. And what he's finding is they're losing their faith at younger and younger ages, and again and again they're citing the fact that science teaches this, them something different than what their faith tells them. What's his remedy? He says we need more people teaching Big Bang cosmology and evolutionary biology in our Catholic schools, and then we could show them that there's no contradiction. But I'm sorry, most of our teachers have been teaching this stuff for the last 50 years, so this cannot possibly be the solution. In fact, the solution is to stop teaching it and to start teaching the truth that is the foundation of our faith and showing that sound science supports and confirms this beautiful doctrine. But the deception that's built into theistic evolution must be understood and then I'm done. You see, when you teach a young Catholic that theistic evolution is true, that God used this evolutionary process in hundreds of millions of years of death and destruction to evolve the bodies of the first human beings. What you're telling them implicitly is that God allowed His church to teach a completely false account of the origins of man in the universe for 1900 years at a very high level of authority. Then, instead of raising up saints and scholars from within the church to enlighten us,
He raised up godless men like Charles Darwin and T.H. Huxley who hated the church and wanted to destroy her and he used them to enlighten us so that we could finally understand how God created the world. Look, young people are not stupid. If that's the case, who in his right mind would stay in the church? Because we're teaching our own children that God's not trustworthy, the church isn't trustworthy, the Bible's not trustworthy. Who are the trustworthy ones? The godless scientists. I'm sorry. We have to come to our senses because we are a church headed for extinction. If we continue on the path that we're on, we won't have any young people left with an integral faith. So I don't expect you to take my word for anything that I've said. I hope and pray that you'll make your own investigation. But all I ask is if you come to the conclusion that what we are defending is the truth, I hope you will get into the fight because we are never going to build a culture of life on any other foundation than the true Catholic doctrine of creation. So I invite you to uh, end by saying the words of the psalm with me. For thou hast formed me and hast laid thy hand upon me. Thou hast protected me from my mother's womb. I will praise thee for thou art fearfully magnified. Wonderful are thy works. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hugh. Thanks, sir. Thank you. <laughs> And then um, also, uh, once you're done doing that, or you know, you don't have to, but if you do, uh, just drop your envelope outside the hall. There's a clear box. Um, it's a see-through uh, box. Just drop your envelope in there, and uh, we'll take care of that uh, uh, when we leave. Um, and uh, also, there's an evaluation form. Uh, our, our one of our volunteers uh, was able to uh, get most of your, um, you know, how did you hear about this event uh, type questions on the way in. Um, thank you so much for for your help with that. Um, and that's uh, Jaylene. She's in the back of the room. Uh, thanks so much to Jaylene for taking time out of your night. I hope you learned something too. Um, <clears throat> but. Uh, if you could just fill out that evaluation form and let us know how you heard about the event. Uh, Josie Zignego, our um, communications director, uh, she's, uh, she, you know, she put a lot of hard work into this and um, we're, so we're always curious to know how people found out about it. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll bring it back to uh, Hugh for the Q&A session, section of, uh, of the talk. If anybody needs to leave, you're certainly welcome to at this point. Uh, but now we open it up to uh, questions from, from the crowd and uh, Hugh will do his best to, uh, to answer those questions. If anybody wants to ask a question, yes, ma'am. Uh, are you also going to be giving the same presentation on, at St. Thomas Aquinas Academy? No, that's going to be, um, that's going to be different. Uh, uh, um, and if you could, do you know um, Angela? Yes. Okay, if you could just see Angela afterwards, she could give you um, a good outline of what I'll be talking about there. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have any special book about some of the things that you talked about today and the other things that you're going to be talking about? Okay, the question is, do, uh, do we have a special book that talks about these matters and other things that I'll be talking about? Um, yes, we do. Unfortunately, um, one of my boxes of books uh, disappeared <laughs> on the way here from Virginia, so I don't have a very big inventory, but um, here's what I would say. Uh, the, um, the book that Pro-Life Wisconsin printed out for you, If You Believe Moses, You Would Believe Me, that really is a very good overview of this subject, so I encourage you to read that. Um, but if you want to go, uh, if you want to go beyond that, uh, there are 
a number of books on our website that really give an excellent in-depth treatment of the creation evolution controversy from a Catholic perspective. One is called A Catholic Assessment of Evolution Theory by John Wynne. Um, I have a priest friend who was teaching sacred scripture in a seminary and he told me this book should be given to every rector of every seminary in the entire world and I agree with him. It's a really amazing uh, in-depth treatment of the controversy from the perspective of theology, philosophy, and natural science. Uh, then we have a book called The Doctrines of Genesis 1 to 11 by Father Victor Walkowitz, who has a PhD in physics as well as two degrees in theology. And uh, Bishop Robert Basha, whom you know because he's one of our uh, strongest pro-life champions among the bishops here in the United States. Uh, he actually wrote the foreword to that book. Um, and that is an excellent compendium of doctrines that are derived from the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And that's also available as an e-book. Both of those are available as e-books on our website. So if you want something that's really in depth, those are the two books that I would most highly recommend. Um, then we have books that are more focused on particular topics like Father Ripperger's book on metaphysics and evolution. Um, Genetic Entropy by Dr. John Sanford, one of the most famous plant geneticists in the world, is the best refutation of biological evolution that I've ever seen. <coughs> um, that's an amazing, an amazing book. And we have other books that focus on particular topics, but <coughs> the two that I mentioned are the best overall treatments of the subject. So if there's something in particular that you're interested in, I could refer you to specific articles on our website or specific um, materials that we carry. Uh, just one other I'll mention because this is very important. Um, you know, there's this idea within the Catholic community that Monsignor Lemaitre was a Catholic priest and he developed the Big Bang hypothesis and therefore that somehow it's almost disloyal not to accept the Big Bang cosmology. But the reality is there are very fundamental problems with the Big Bang cosmology, the, not the least of which is it assumes the framework of Descartes. It's based on the false premise that you can extrapolate from what we see now all the way back literally to the beginning of the universe. And that from the get-go is wrong. If, you, if that's your starting point, you're never going to come out with the right answer. But we carry, <laughs> um, we have an article on our website by Dr. Thomas Seiler, who has a PhD in physics from the Technical University in Munich, um, on cosmology, um, the, the Big Bang, and the Christian doctrine of creation, or something like that. And that is an excellent, very easy to understand refutation of the Big Bang cosmology. And then we carry um, two DVDs by an astronomer named Spike Pissaris, <coughs> who was an atheist when he entered the space program and became a believer just through studying astronomy. He became a believer in God from studying astronomy before he became a Christian. And his DVDs are really excellent in showing that all the naturalistic accounts for the origins of stars, the origins of galaxies, the origins of the solar system, they do not correspond to reality. And uh, those are excellent if you want something that you can watch in an hour and uh, really understand that the Big Bang cosmology is not anything like what it's cracked up to be. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry about Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict. Okay, you mean the slide on Pope Benedict. Okay, what I was going to say about Pope Benedict was that um, a few years ago he went to Ireland and um, at that time the mass media in Ireland was constantly talking about abuse that, was go that had gone on and it was just reveling in this. And uh, the Pope, in that, in that slide, he makes the statement, how can we explain this? that people who offered the Holy Mass every day, you know, who did all these exterior acts of worship, could then turn around and commit these acts 
these abominations on innocent children. And uh, the reason I have that slide there is that he says, I can't explain this, but, but I truly believe that we can explain it. And um, it's important enough that I'll, I'll back up to there and I'll show you why. Because I think this is very, very important to understand. See, here's the slide. He's talking about all these abominations that were perpetrated by members of the clergy and consecrated religious in Ireland, which have contributed to the almost total destruction of the faith in Ireland. I've been over there a number of times, and it's, it's absolutely beyond belief. But this is not difficult to explain, and I'll, I'll do it in two minutes with a few slides. See, this is the man that was raised in a devout Protestant home here in the United States. <clears throat> then he went to university for a while. He held on to his belief in God, but finally he caved under all the evolutionary indoctrination, became an evolutionist and an atheist. He got his doctorate from Harvard, and then he founded a new science, the science of perversion. But what many people don't realize is that the way he got funding from the Rockefeller Foundation to begin this diabolical project was completely on the basis of evolution. Because the, the premise of this man and his confederates was that, you know, back in the Middle Ages, we had this quaint idea that God created man and he created him with a certain nature, and there were some actions that were in accordance with that nature, which were good, but there were other actions that were not in accordance with it, which were abnormal, unnatural, and evil. And so their position was, we're liberated from that now, because we know that we've come to be through a process of evolution, and we know that our cousins, the bonobos, the chimpanzees, and the gorillas, they do all this kind of behavior that back in the Middle Ages we used to think was unnatural. But thanks to evolution, we know that it's actually natural, normal, and good. And that really was this quote-unquote scientific basis for his getting funding to support this diabolical project. But look at this. It's, it's bad enough that Kinsey and his associates, with their bogus diabolical research, were able to get the criminal code changed and the medical code changed and the psychiat psychiatric code changed. So things that really are unnatural and abnormal are now made to be natural, normal, and good. The, the real, just mind-boggling, heartbreaking abomination is that this same diabolical non-science was embraced by so many of our own Catholic intellectuals. Here we have Father Kosnick, who was the dean of a Catholic seminary here in the United States at the height of the abuse that was going on. And he publishes an article in the Journal of the Catholic Theological Society of America, and this is his conclusion. He concludes that the behavioral sciences have not identified any sexual expression that can be empirically demonstrated to be of itself in a culture-free way detrimental to a full human existence. He says, empirical science hasn't shown us anything you can do that we can really say it's harmful. Now, we know that from the beginning of the church, the devil has always attacked with his minions, priests, and consecrated souls. There's nothing new about that. But what's new here is never before did we have quote-unquote science giving people an excuse for giving in to those temptations. And that's what we have. These are the people who are training seminarians and don't think that this has disappeared from the seminaries. It hasn't. And it's all based on evolutionary pseudoscience. It has no credibility whatsoever except on the basis that evolution is something real that happened. And look at this. Bishop McHugh was put in charge of family life matters for the Bishop's Conference here in the United States. And he was the person who worked with Planned Parenthood educators, miseducators, 
to bring godless sex education into Catholic schools throughout the United States of America. How is that possible? How does the bishop in charge of family life work hand in hand with godless Planned Parenthood sex educators to develop such ed sex education programs for Catholic schools? Well, here's the answer. I'll translate it from gobbledygook into English, but I'm not changing his meaning. What he's saying here is, we know that at this point in our evolution, the union between man and woman is the normal way that babies come into the world. But, he says, we can't rule out that in the future there could be wonderful evolutionary breakthroughs that would result in children coming into the world some other way. You see how profoundly disordered this is because our Lord Jesus Christ said what God has joined together let not man put asunder. And that doesn't just mean the husband and wife, although of course it means that. It also means the unitive and procreative dimensions of the marital union. But what has he done? That's exactly what he's done. Because he doesn't accept the truth that God created one man for one woman for life, that God created marriage and showed the union between them by the very way he created the woman from the body of the man, because he rejects that as a myth and embraces the quote-unquote science of evolution, he's perfectly fine with the idea that the marital union is only a temporary thing temporarily associated with procreation. So in his mind, he's already got the contraceptive mentality because he's got, he thinks that science has proven that the unitive and procreative were, are not inseparable from the marital union. And here's the, here's the culmination. At the Synod on the Family, Cardinal Baldessari was made the moderator of the Synod. If you don't think there's a lot writing on this, just look at this. When the members of the media asked Cardinal Paul de Seri, Your Eminence, how can it be that the delegates are spending so much time talking about how to find a way to give Holy Communion to people who are living in adultery or people who are living in uh, unnatural vice? His answer was, look, don't be scandalized if there is a cardinal or a theologian saying something that's different from the so-called common doctrine, that doesn't imply going against. It means reflecting, because dogma has its own evolution. That is a development, not a change. This is exactly what Pope St. Pius X predicted in Pescendi. And how are we ever going to win the war against the anti-culture of death if we don't even identify the root of the whole rotten structure? We're just like doctors endlessly attacking symptoms and never identifying the cause of the disease. We, will, we can be the most dedicated, devoted people in the whole wide world and we'll still never get anywhere. But the minute you start, just, just go out into the world and start showing people that evolution is a fraud and see what the devil and his demons do to you. And you'll learn very fast that this is one thing that they do not want you to speak about. So that's why I'm here. And I thank God that Wisconsin Pro-Life had the fortitude to do what very few organizations like yours have been willing to do, because they get shut down. I can't tell you how many times we've been invited to speak in many different places, and the calls come, the angry people, these people are fundamentalists, this is a disgrace that you have them, and we get shut down. And the devil's happy. Then he says, yeah, go ahead, talk about chastity or talk about how terrible abortion is. Because it's fine with me, because you, you haven't done anything to what really is giving me my hold on these people. So go right ahead. But once you, once you identify this as the root of the whole anti-culture of death, 
That's when the real battle begins. But he's, he'll, there's, he's done for. Once we recognize that that's where we need to concentrate our forces, he doesn't stand a chance because the truth is 100% on our side. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I had a couple of questions, but I think mostly I wanted to know, because I also read this document here that you, that you gave us all, um, and you speak about science, not natural science, not really having a role in uh, probing the question of the origin of creation, um, that that's more of a, within the realm of theology. Right. Um, and that natural science really comes in after that. Correct. So I guess then I, I wonder then what is the role of science in this question? Because it seems that that, it seems that really any time that science asks this question about the nature of creation, it's getting into to something evil and diabolical. And I don't think that's a fair assumption to make. I think there are times when science can ask in a beautiful, freeing, questioning, wandering way, consistent with the truth, and ask without assuming anything about God. Um, like, I, I think there is a way in which we can ask about the nature of creation and its origins without engaging in, in evil. Um, and I, I don't think you spoke really to that and how science can also be used in a beautiful way to, to encourage the culture of life and not just support the culture of death. Okay, well, that's a, that's a very important question. But nobody is more convinced that we can use natural science in the proper way to support a culture of life. But let me emphasize the distinction that we are trying to make, which is fundamental. And St. Thomas makes this distinction in the Summa, and he sums it up very beautifully in these words. He says, in the works of nature, creation does not enter, but is presupposed to the works of nature. And when you work within that framework, as he does, He's recognizing that God created all the different kinds of creatures up to and including Adam and Eve by willing them into existence and then he stopped this, the supernatural work of creation and from that point forward he's holding everything in existence but he's not creating anything new. So we're not saying that natural scientists have no role in understanding creation or in building up a culture of life. What we're saying is that it is a philosophical error with potentially f very bad consequences to assume that there is no such boundary between the supernatural work of creation and the natural order which only began when the work of creation was finished because if you make the assumption that St. Peter warned us against and that Descartes and Immanuel Kant and the Enlightenment philosophers promoted and you hold that the same material processes and natural processes that are going on now have been operating in more or less the same way from the very beginning of the universe then you're going to think that it is possible to extrapolate from what we observe here and now to explain how everything came to be and not only, do, not only is it impossible, but the answers that, that scientists have come up with when that's their starting point have had very negative consequences. And I've only had a little bit of time, so I haven't been able to show you more than a few, but I think hopefully the few that I've... I have really positive consequences, though, that have come out of, uh, up, up, out of evolutionary, that evolutionary hypothesis. Okay, well, he, this is where I think another distinction needs to be made because um, we can look uh, at any scientific discovery that has had constructive results in the last 150 years and I believe that it will be entirely possible in every case to separate that entirely from the evolutionary framework. L let me give you an example that I think um, but the, but the thing is, if you actually examine them, it's not that the evolutionary presuppositions are not aiding the research. 
the, let me give let me give you an example. The um, if you if you look at the um, whole history of apologetics in favor of evolution, one of the main arguments that the evolutionists have used, and they're still using it today, is that we have this feature of the human body um, or of an animal and it has no function now therefore it must be a holdover from an earlier stage of evolution when I was a child if you had even a couple of infections in your throat it was absolutely standard practice to be recommended to have your tonsils removed why because the consensus view was the tonsils were not functional and if your tonsils got infected it was better for you to have them removed because they were a holdover from an earlier stage of evolution. There were countless millions of totally unnecessary tonsillectomies which required general anesthesia for children and it was all based on this evolutionary pseudoscience. Subsequent medical research has proven that there are very, very few cases where tonsillectomy is actually indicated and there have even been long-term studies where they have had two groups they have the same basic medical history one gets the tonsillectomy the other doesn't they follow them for 20 or 30 years the ones that didn't get the tonsillectomy are healthier than the ones who did because in the subsequent decades beginning in the 1970s you had uh, articles appearing in peer-reviewed medical journals showing that the tonsils are part of the immune system and now it's uh, generally recognized that the tonsils are part of our immune system <laughs> and this is something that everybody who held to the traditional doctrine of creation was saying from the beginning there was nobody who adhered to the framework of St. Thomas and the Church Fathers and Doctors, whoever went along with the idea that tonsils were a useless holdover from an earlier stage of evolution. So if the traditional framework of St. Thomas and the Church Fathers and Doctors had been maintained, when the, when the scientific community encountered this organ which they didn't understand, they would not have said hmm, we're getting a lot of children coming into doctor's offices with infections in the tonsils. They must be a problem. They must be a holdover from an earlier stage of evolution. No. What they would have done is what Leonardo da Vinci or William Harvey or any of the great scientists who believed in creation would have done. They would have said, we know that God created man with all his organs. Therefore, we may not understand why these tonsils are there, but they are definitely there for some purpose and we need to figure out why they're there. And they would have figured out something else, and this is very, very important to understand. They would have also said, look, if, if, if we are getting so many young people coming into hospitals and doctor's offices with infected tonsils, we can't blame the tonsils, we can't blame God's handiwork there's got to be something wrong with the way these people are living, you see? But they never said that, because the consensus view was the tonsils are a useless holdover from evolution. If they're causing you problems, take them out. It won't make any difference anyway, because at our stage of evolution, they're no longer functional. Just think about it. If we had maintained the traditional Catholic framework for doing scientific and medical research, they would have been saying, what is it that we are doing wrong in the way that we live, in the way that we eat? And what they would have found is that the problems with the tonsils are directly related to bad lifestyle, to poor diet, to poor nutrition, to po lack of exercise, and all the things that characterize the typical American way of life at the beginning of the 21st century. And maybe if we had awakened to that back in the 1920s and 30s, we would have started to address those problems instead of shifting the blame for them onto the poor old tonsils which we simply cast in the role of useless holdover from earlier stage of evolution. We have an article on our website, um, The Negative Impact of Faith in the Evolutionary Hypothesis, 
on scientific and medical research and please read the article and see if you're not convinced that what I'm telling you is true because it gives example after example after example of where faith and evolution retarded scientific progress. Now, it's very possible, I mean, let's, let's face the fact, somewhere along the line, these scientists and medical researchers who believed in evolution were able to identify functionality in the tonsils. But wouldn't they have discovered it a lot faster if they believed in, in the true doctrine of creation? Of course they would, because they would never assume that not recognizing a function in the organ of a plant, animal, or human being is synonymous with not having a function, you see? So we believe that when we go back to the true Catholic framework for doing uh, scientific and medical research, we're going to have a golden age of scientific and medical research. Um, it's not going to be Bill Nye wants young people to think, oh, these people who believe in creation, they're anti-science. Please read that article on our website. I think you will be very well convinced that it's evolution that is anti-science. It is not the traditional doctrine of creation that is anti-science. And uh, let me just give you one more example because this is very important to understand. Dr. Jerry Coyne is arguably one of the leading scientist champions of evolution in the whole world. He's got a genius IQ, I'm sure. He got his PhD from Harvard. He's at the University of Chicago. And in this book, Why Evolution is True, he tells the young people of the whole world that embryology is still a very strong proof for evolution. Now, let's look at his, at his proof, and this will be the last um, point that I'm going to make. He says that every little baby in the mother's womb is covered with a transitory coat of hair. The technical name for it is lanugo. Now, watch his reasoning very carefully. He says there's no need for a little baby to have a transitory coat of hair. It's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit in the mother's womb. Therefore, watch his logic, it must be a useless holdover from an earlier stage of evolution when we were covered with hair and swinging from the trees. Now this is anti-science, because if it was Leonardo da Vinci or William Harvey or anybody that was working within the Catholic framework that distinguishes between the supernatural work of creation and the natural order, they would never say, I don't understand why this is here, it must be a useless holdover. No. They would have said, I'm not smart enough yet to understand why this is here. But I know that God created every feature of the human body for a purpose. And sure enough, if you have ever had the immense privilege of holding or even beholding a brand new baby come into the world and I've had this privilege with every one of my children and the last one number nine came so fast that the midwife couldn't get there soon enough and I delivered him myself <laughs> but this spectacle is what you'll see when a baby comes into the world at term she'll be covered with something that looks like yogurt the technical name for it is vernix cassiosa but there's an engineering problem that had to be overcome. How do you keep something like yogurt on the smooth skin of a little baby while she's immersed in liquid, immersed in the amniotic fluid for months at a time? Any suggestions? <laughs> of course, when we have children in the audience, you know, a five-year-old will raise her hand and say, the hair. And I say, well, you didn't get a PhD from Harvard. How are you able to figure out that out so quickly? Well, it so happens that years before Dr. Jerry Coyne went into print with Why Evolution is True, any course in midwifery or obstetrics or embryology worth its salt was teaching students that vernix cassios is a culmination of sebaceous gland secretions and dead epidermal cells, and the lanugo hair helps keep it on the outer skin surface. So what we can see is Dr. Jerry Coyne with his genius IQ was blinded, completely blinded to common sense reality, did not proceed as a good natural scientist ought to do because of his blind faith in a bankrupt hypothesis. 
And when we go back to working within the framework that's provided to us by the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation, we will no longer see this. We will see scientists and medical researchers looking at things as they are. And in our biology classes, in our science classes, our, our, our children will be breaking out into psalms, praising God. God, you're so great. You thought of everything. You thought of this lanugo, how to keep the vernix cassios on the skin of the baby. God, you are so great. But instead, you don't hear that in Catholic biology classrooms. You hear the most likely the teacher saying, boys and girls, we're not like those fundamentalists who think they can just open Genesis and believe what it says. We have a much more sophisticated understanding of faith and reason. So, I, again, don't take my word for it. Please make your own investigation. But if you conclude that what we're defending is the truth, please get into the fight. Because our objective is that every young person on the face of the earth have at least one opportunity to hear a good defense of the true Catholic doctrine of creation. And our standard seminar is five to six hours long, so I'm afraid I really was only able to scratch the scratch. I'm coming to the end of my strength, obviously, scratch the surface. But yes, ma'am. So are you taking a five or six hour presentation into the colleges? There's, there are very few colleges that will even let us on campus. We, I mean, the, th the thing that's the thing that is so heartrending is that most of the people in charge of Catholic schools and universities and seminaries not only will not teach this, they will fight to prevent us from even being able to present the other side or to have a debate. And, um, but if you can find a venue where we could present our whole seminar, we'd gladly go at no expense to the institution to, to present it. All right, I think I need to let you go home. <laughs> so, thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, there's, I, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but there are only two Catholic universities that I know that, um, that really teach um, that, that are really open to, to this kind of teaching. One is Gustav Siebert Academy in Germany, which was uh, founded by a German philosopher named Alma von Stockhausen with the help of Bishop uh, Ratzinger, um, who later became Pope Benedict. Um, and it's kind of a long story how they came to reject evolution, but I just don't have time to get into it. Recently, however, they were shut down because the Green Party was elected into office in their part of Germany, and the Green Party representatives came to Dr. von Stockhausen and to the rector and said, uh, you can continue to operate as a university, but you must sign this agreement. You know what the agreement said? The agreements pledged them to accept that there is no absolute truth. I suppose they had a clause, except that there is no absolute truth. But at any rate, they couldn't sign the document, so they literally got shut down because they wouldn't agree that there is no absolute truth, except that there is no absolute truth. Now, the other university that I know that, um, that teaches this, that allows us to address the students directly, is a small college in Ireland. Ireland is going under. <laughs> It's in a total disaster, but this little college, Newman College, was founded by a super pro-life uh, lady named Kathy Sinnott, who was a member of the European Parliament. And um, they're, they're actually teaching this, or at least allowing it to be taught. And their main theologian, Father Thomas Crean, is um, one of the few Dominicans in the whole world who actually upholds the true teaching of St. Thomas on creation and who, who rejects evolution. Um, let me just end with a, something in connection with that, because this is pretty sobering. When Ireland had the referendum on, on unnatural marriage a couple of years ago, some of my friends over there invited me over to give talks in different places 
to try to inspire at least the lay faithful to get out and fight for natural marriage. They could only arrange one venue in the whole country because everybody was terrified of activists uh, meeting out retribution against them for allowing me to give this terrible talk in defense of Adam and Eve and the, the basis in theology, philosophy, and natural science for natural marriage. So what happened in the referendum? The church was pretty much silenced and 95% of the young adult voters voted to make unnatural marriage exactly the same before the, uh, before the law as natural marriage. Now, we're talking about Ireland. Virtually all of that 95% were baptized Catholics, made their first Holy Communion, went to Catholic school or CCD. How could that happen? Simple. They were all taught evolution. Every last one of them was taught evolution. It's virtually guaranteed. And so it's easy for them to just throw away the whole traditional teaching of the church because on that basis, it's just easy to believe that, well, we've evolved, we need a new morality, we need a new uh, law, we need everything new to accord with the new stage of evolution that we've reached. Thank you. Thank you.